Right, 5.1, increase in value of contract uh, TDC road marking, 2013 to 2016. Mr Dennis Lewis, Infrastructure Manager. Good afternoon, Dennis. Good afternoon, Your Worship, Councillors. Um, I'll take this item as read. Uh, essentially, it's a, an increase in the value of the road marking contract by $30,000 through to the 30th of June 2018, and that's for some new road marking that needs to be done in that period. Thank you, Dennis. Any questions of Dennis? Councillor Body. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Um, in regards to the road markings, this is the white lines on the roads, and when they undertake the contract, do they also have to do the give way writing on the road? Yes. They required to remark all of the current markings. Well, I'm sure in the area that I come from that while the new white lines are there, the giveaway markings are not on the road. Oh, are sorry, the, the, the giveaway marking is no longer marked on the road. That's part of that's the current standard. Okay, so there's just now the sign, no markings. Yeah, at all. The, you've got the sign and the marking. Yep. And that's correct. Okay, sorry, thank you. Is it that you mark the road still with the yes. giveaway sign? Yep, yep, yep. So we so this contract is for remarking what's on the road. So John's well, got my, a query. My Sorry, concern that it, might, got a query. that it might not have been done. I've seen them do the yellow markings, I've seen yep. them do the white markings, but I haven't seen the giveaway and it seems to be more than one occasion I've come across it. Oh so Thanks you're saying question. that there are current give giveaway words that haven't been remarked. Well if the white line looks like it's new and the white line the white markings of the giveaway sign look like they'd be old they haven't been done. Right. Yeah. We certainly check on that. We do have someone that um, monitors that quite closely. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions of Mr Lewis? All right, the... Uh, oh, fuck me. City. The resolution there. Sorry. Uh, council. The resolution. I've lost it now too. <laughs> Need a hard copy. Uh, where are we? <laughs> Sorry. Yep. Okay. Resolution there. Recommend. Oh, steady. Steady. It approves the increase in value of contract uh, road marking 2013-16 with Road Runner Markers Limited, which expires on the 30th of June 2018 by 30,000 plus GST, to a total of 912,313,060 cents plus GST. Correct. Do I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Hickling, seconded by Councillor Rankin. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Those against, carried. Right, item... Five point two, upgrade of Taupo street lights with LED luminaires. Mr Lewis, again. Your Worship, this is for the um, installation of the luminaires. If you recall, um, prior to Christmas we had a tender recommendation for the purchase of the luminaires. Um, so this is for the installation of those luminaires. Um, there's a recommendation there for Downer. Um, they were the lowest price conforming tender. Um, I'll take the item as read and answer any questions. Okay, any questions, Ms Lewis? Uh, Councillor Park. Yes, um, thanks. Um, Dennis, just with regards to a current, um, uh, one of the tenderers who has currently looked after our streetlights, um, is it just based on the, the, the waiting attributes that has... Yep. That's okay. correct. Um, I, I just think this is a wonderful opportunity and it's fantastic that we've had um, regional funding to pay for the majority of it, so I'm happy to move this recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Park. Um, seconded by Councillor Stewart, actually. Um, so, Councillor Park and seconded by Councillor Stewart. What is exactly the uh, central government um, investment? 85%. 85%, cool. All right. Uh, move Councillor Park, seconded by Councillor Stewart. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Is against? Carried. I'll just answer that one. Providing the luminaires have been purchased before the 30th of June, we've got until the end of December to get the inst install done. Um, NZ yeah, NZTA recognise that this is across the whole of the country um, and it's a challenge to do the whole of the country in that space of time. 
Right, thank you Mr Lewis. 5.3, new road names, Whariwaka East Subdivision. Mr Scott Davenport. Afternoon Scott. Good. Any questions for Scott? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Chairman, is that the total names of the road? I see Manganui Road. Is that an existing name? Mangamahu. On on the map at the back, there's a blue road. Something rather drive. Okay. 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 And which is Roto Road on the map? Ropo Crescent. Close. Oh, Roto. Yep. That was an existing road, was it? It's in green. Just below the blue road at the top, because that's that's not on on the on the list. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Lovely. Any other questions of Scott? Good. Uh, quite. Uh, Risby easy names to pronounce, which is good too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, recommendation there. Would someone like to move that, please? Councillor Tonga Tonganui Kingi, seconded by Councillor Williamson. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. It's against. Carried. Five point four: Acacia Bay water options to meet the drinking water standards for New Zealand. Mr. Lewis, again. And Mr Cordell, was it? Yeah, yeah, Mr Cordell. Afternoon, Mike. Right, floor is yours. Afternoon. <laughs> um, if you recall, um, prior to Christmas, we had a workshop with Council regarding the Acacia Bay um, water supply and um, upgrade to meet the drinking water standard. We went through the options with you at that time, and now we've <coughs> we indicated at that time that we'd bring a report seeking a decision. Um, this is that report, and I'll pass it over to Mike if, if he wants to run through the report, but it's essentially what we went through with the workshop uh, just prior to Christmas. Yes, yeah, so there's nothing new in the report that you wouldn't have heard already in the workshop, so um, I'll just take questions if there are any. Okay, questions. So we've got two options here, right? So, so the two options, I'll run through them quickly, are um, so the project is to upgrade Acacia Bay's water supply to meet the drinking water standards. The two options are build a new plant in Acacia Bay, or the alternative to connect Taupo and Acacia Bay uh, and merge the schemes and supply water from our plant on Lake Terrace. Okay. Um, and costs? We've got some identified some costs here. Yep. So the estimate to build a new plant in Acacia Bay is um, some detail on page two, six point two million dollars. And to build a pipeline and pump station from town is four point five. And there's also a, sort of a precursor project if you want to connect to Acacia Bay. We have to do an upgrade to the plant in Taupo. First, that's 1.75 million dollars. The, the uh, we're saying that forecasting that the plant upgrade in Taupo is required regardless of the option. We've pushed this plant to 99% capacity a couple of years ago on a dry summer, uh, and so uh, we haven't taken the 1.75 million dollars into account when comparing the two options on the rates impact. 
that's because that's occurring on both. So the increases are comparing <coughs> uh, 6.2 and 4.5. Okay. Councillor Hickling. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just need to have some surety that we are sort of not putting all our eggs in one basket and that you know, I, I just feel that we perhaps should be perhaps looking at two water supplies. Um, I just I, I understand the, the saving through the maintenance and I'm uh, through the workshop I was for the one option of Lake Terrace but I'd just like some assurance because if we have a major earthquake like the Canterbury one we just put all our eggs into one basket control gates bridge, bridge gets knocked out how do we get supply across through there ok we've got the ETA and trucks can go around but yeah, I just just need I need some assurance that we're not, you know, because it's a big decision. We we are probably only will save over a million dollars, which is a million dollars, admittedly, and there'll be savings further with maintenance. But could not the Acacia Bay um, supply? finish up supplying Nooker Howe and Marper Road and all around this side of the town. Um, just, yeah, Okay. I, I just need some assurance that... <coughs> you have um, excellent question, Councillor, and you've, there's more than one question there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll try and answer them all. Um, in terms of of earthquakes and the size, um, it depends on the size of the earthquake, what impact is going to be on our infrastructure. Um, there is no guarantee that if you had an earthquake of any significance that's going to knock out the Control Gates Bridge, for instance, that it's going to knock out the Taupo plant and the Acacia Bay plant. Um, and asking any of us engineers to forecast what size earthquake we're going to have and what the impact is, is a little bit challenging to say the least. Certainly the Taupo plant has been built with stand, I think it's one in a hundred um, type event, so there's a lot of um, effort into the foundations and um, the retaining walls and the like. Um, but there's also all of the pipe work, so I, I'm, I can't give you an assurance. We did talk about this amongst ourselves in quite some depth, uh, so there's a couple of um, points. We do have two water mains running, one across the bridge and, and one underneath the harbour at the moment as well. Uh, so there's, there's dual feed there. There's also, when you think about the relative scale of these plants, the Topol plant is 25 MLD, 30 and 35 after the upgrades. The Cache Bay will be two and a half, three. So it's, it's quite a lot smaller. We're also going to have uh, Kinloch water supply on that side, which it's not physically connected, but there are um, opportunities for you know, tankering water if, if that supply was still cut in, in place. So. I just want um, and the, the, the fact that the lake separates the two, and the two parts of town, the north, should we say, or the west and the east, and I, I yeah, it's just. Just me thinking. Yeah. Yes. They're all good questions. And, and I think there's three things in this decision. One's the economic product, um, one's the resilience, which is what we're talking about, <coughs> um, and how significant it has been, and what's the difference that we're having. Depending on the earthquake and the size, there's, there's different responses that you have, and, and we've got con contingency plans depending on what that happens. Um, and then the third one is, is the other considerations that we've got in the paper around fluoride and other things like that. So that would be the three considerations that you've got to take in mind when, you, when you're making this decision. Um, I think the, the, the engineers have talked about the resilience to you, but, um, but it really does come down to, in a, in a major event, you're going to be coping with that sort of thing anyway. Keep your fingers crossed. Um, and I guess when you think of most urban areas, um, most urban areas are served by one plant. Um, so 
I think yeah, I think probably with there's probably only us and, and one other district that I can think of in Queenstown Lakes which has the same number of plants servicing small communities and that definitely brings us challenges in terms of the, the ongoing maintenance, the ongoing operations and in fact the ongoing um, compliance with the drinking water standards. That's why this council is probably behind the, the pack of councils in terms of compliance with drinking water standards because we're having to do it for a whole lot of little plants which then creates major affordability issues because as you know water is funded by the people on that scheme um, and that, that the less users on the scheme the less affordable any upgrade is to that plant. Yes, really oh. oh, you, wish, you think you wish it? Yeah, I think probably, you know, obviously council electing makes, you know, makes a very, very, you know, some very good point. Uh, going forward, obviously, um, I understand w w from what's, what we're hearing, we're, it's not what 1.2 million to upgrade our treatment plant to accommodate Acacia Bay. 1.75. 1.75. Um, obviously, projecting forward to th what 2056 was, it's still enough capacity in that plant to accommodate. Yeah, there's one the more stage of upgrade that can yeah. occur mm -hmm. uh, after this proposed upgrade, that which would take the plant capacity to 35 MLD, and uh, we see that as yeah. sufficient capacity for our forecasts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Just to Councillor Harvey, just to refresh my memory, how far through Acacia Bay are we talking? Right out to Marpara Road, right? How far? So this. The Acacia Bay scheme supplies um, most of the Mapra Valley. So it would all yes. be in part yeah. of that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Jim. Yes, <coughs> Councillor Body. Jim, could I yeah, support Councillor Hickling's uh, comments? I find it rather interesting that three years ago we did a long term plan, and if I can quote from it, it says that this year, or 1718, begin the construction of the Acacia Bay Water Treatment Plant upgrade to meet the drinking standards. I'm just wondering why we made that decision, the last long-term plan, but looking at another alternative. I also have a question in regards of the, um, and it's mentioned in this report, and that's to do with fluoride in the water. Now, I'm not going to argue for or against. I'm arguing for the right to choose. And if uh, Acacia Bay kicks into Taupo, they're not going to have the right to choose. They're going to get it. So I'm interested in what the report says on page of the Agenda 71 and it states the option of a new water treatment plant at Acacia Bay allows for the possibility, possibility to continue to provide a water supply to Acacia Bay post the upgrade that does not have fluoride addition. And then the next paragraph down it states it will be compl complex and costly to provide Acacia Bay with a water supply from Taupo that is free of fluoride without removing fluoride addition from, that's a contradiction. Mm, so the way I read... So the, the first question about the long-term plan um, three years ago, yes, that was the plan. Um, and in, we're always on the lookout for um, cost-effective and um, better value for our ratepayers. So we, before we progressed any further on the, on the building of a new plant, we re-evaluated um, all of the scenarios and hence why we're here today. Could I then, um, Mr Chairman, just go to page 83 where it states the lack of robustness. Issues stemming from the Lake uh, Terrace water treatment plant would directly affect the Acacia Bay Marpra communities. The provision of a dedicated water treatment plant for Acacia Bay community provides the community with a level of robustness and removes the re re resilience on the maintenance of the Taupo Acacia Bay infrastructure. Um, at this stage, I'm not going to prejudge. This is going out for consultation. So I think the factors have to be borne um, in mind while we do that. But I'm also interesting, it seems to be some different figures in regards of costs. If we go to page 79, it states that to connect to the treatment plant here would be 6,219,000 and sorry for Acacia Bay and then 5,000, 5 million 337 for Lake Terrace. If we turn to page 81, the first one is 6219 there, but the next one down, Acacia Bay network upgrades is 4572. Why was there the difference? This is the way the consultants have allocated the costs of the 
upgrade to the total treatment plant. So they've, in the earlier figure, which is higher for Acacia Bay, they've allocated a part cost of upgrading that plant to the Acacia Bay project. But that's when we're talking about what are the cost of our projects. We've got quite discrete projects. We've got a total water treatment plant upgrade and Acacia Bay um, connection. So the way we've presented it is separating. They've pulled them together to try and form a, a balanced cost view, which is um, somewhat difficult because it's, it's hard to interpret um, when we have to do the upgrade to the total plant anyway at some point. And, and so that's the so the difference between the two figures, one on page 79 and the other one, is because of the upgrade to get us at 35 million litres a day? Yes, they've taken a part of that cost and applied it to the Acacia Bay pr Connection to Town project okay. to try and draw a, a, a comparative, you know, okay. cost, a fair cost analysis between the two. Okay. But from a financial point of view, we have to build the total upgrade anyway, is what we're saying. So okay. Regardless of scenario, that happens. Thank you. Councillor Rankin. I, I certainly respect Councillor Rankin to say what she has said. I'm just making the comment that I believe it's a matter of personal choice and I think we have to show leadership in that regard. Yeah, you wish it. Okay, okay Councillor Williamson. I think, you know, as Gareth has mentioned, obviously, as we all know, it's boils down economics, resilience, and fluoride is another, another important issue. Well, we'll be, you know, as it goes out for consultation. Um, but you know, if you're you know with the ratepayers having to still wear another or well, double their water rate, um, you know that's that's a, that's a pretty big deal. You know, in terms of the, you know, ongoing costs, I think you probably find there'll be um, not too much support for that. You know, I would imagine. But um, but I do t do take the point about resilience and having perhaps the option of two water supplies yeah. going forward as merits and that. But I think we just have to be sort of be trying to be relevant, mm. some common sense in terms of the. The, the economics of it, um, and we can't foresee the, you know, with ground resilience, we can't foresee what may or may not happen. But um, so I think on that on that balance, it's sort of we have to make a call. I think on probably more the economics of it. Okay, Councillor Park. Um, and well, just through the chair, having done an LTP or two, we we have to go out with a preferred option. It doesn't mean that's the option that going to be selected at the end of the day we, but we, we do have to go out with an option and then ask the community for their feedback so I, I've seen merit in both sides but I'm, I I think that where we've come to um, is about the economics and value for ratepayers and I'm, I'm quite happy with <coughs> the recommendation to go out that way and let, let's hear what the community want to do I mean if the, it's outweighed big time that the third option is one, then so be it, but we're not going to know until we get past this agenda item and, and put it out to them to help us make an informed decision. Any other commentary? Um, just thank you. Councilor just Grant. through the Chair, uh, um, when we do go out for consultation, the first option was the standalone treatment, but we, we, I don't know if we're deliberately vague, but we don't talk about the potential locations, and I mean I'm not saying we would signal a site, but we say there's difficulty in finding a site, so we need to be practical here and maybe give people a steer on a likelihood of where it might be because yeah. that may influence some people's decisions. Yeah. We um, did have one site in mind um, a couple of three years ago and that was um, an area of land adjacent to a property that council owned up, and I can't remember the name of the street, um, Yep, um, we're now looking at um, um, leasing some land and we um, have only initiated discussions adjacent to the wastewater treatment plant. But the engineer's preferred option is to run it back into town. Yes. And the problem with, I guess, signalling anything in there about those, those land 
options is that that automatically then changes your your property market, whether it be lease or, or buy. So we have to be mm -hmm. pretty careful about what we say and how we say that. So what we are confident in is that from an engineering perspective it can happen um, and and any plant, if you've put enough money at it, it, you can design it to mitigate your effects. You can make it look like a house if you want to spend enough money doing it. Um, so it can happen and we've got Public Works Act to, if we really had to, to, to acquire land. Um, but of course that they're all pretty hard, blunt, blunt tools to get to. So hence we prefer to try and do other things. But it is a practical option, option one. Um, but the preferred option is option two. Okay, all right, so the recommendation is there. Moved by Councillor Harvey, seen by Councillor Park. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Okay, we'll look forward to the, the feedback on that. Right, 5.5 .5, Civic Administration Building Project. Nick, the floor is yours, sir. Good afternoon, Nick. Um, uh, this item should be relatively straightforward. Uh, it's seeking to do a couple of things. First of all, um, seeking confirmation that the Great Lakes Centre is your preferred site. Secondly, that uh, you wish officers to move on towards the next phase of, uh, I guess, due diligence process and do the master planning for that location. Uh, thirdly, it's looking for uh, some clear direction that you wish the museum to be part of that master planning process. And finally, um, it, it almost looks like a little bit of an orphan. It's, um, it's looking for adoption of the supporting information regarding this building and its funding in the LTP. Um, that last part could have gone into this item or another item. It's sat in here simply because it's directly related to the building. Um, I won't go over a whole lot of detail. You've, you've done that essentially ad nauseum through a range of workshops, so I'll, um, I'll leave it at that point. Happy to take any questions. Well, uh, uh, essentially, oh, it, it's totally up to you. Um, this is simply about confirming the direction that you've already provided officers in workshops to enable us to go forward and do the next phase of work. It, it's not making any final decisions. It's not making any specific commitment. It's simply giving us as officers direction to carry on and do the next phase of work to assist your future decision making. Um, yes, um, I, I, after last week speaking to Wayne Marriott, I was really excited about looking at, you know, what are those, what are what the possibilities could be like. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm for this recommendation. I just think we just need to be very careful that the. Um, I think that there are probably some of our ratepayers and residents out there who are presuming that this is going on the the green space, as in was in, um, mm -hmm. sort of talked about 10 years ago, where that in fact is, is totally incorrect. Correct. Yeah, you, you'll see in the report we talked about uh, specifically the local purpose reserve around the uh, Great Lakes Centre, to give it a, a very clear definition. Nick, through the report, and um, I see where you refer to the precinct. Yes. Could you outline? Sorry. Could you outline the boundaries of what you perceive is the precinct, please? The, there are no hard and fast boundaries. Um, uh, it's simply a term referring to that broader area. Um, 
as, as you will remember through the commercial industrial structure plan um, we talked a lot about linkages through from the town center down to the boat harbor yes. um, i'd expect that those linkages will be part of this master plan exercise we talked a lot about the connection across from the recreation area on the tongariro domain to the commercial area across tongariro street again those connections will be really important can you it, it's not about saying one side of Tongariro Street is the boundary or the other. It's no. it's more to do with those connections in so the general can, space. I can uh, possibly get to the I can probably get to the to the heart of the question. Whilst the domain and the northern domain in particular would be taken into account in the structure planning or in the, in the planning exercise to look at where the linkages come from, no nothing in this would allow officers to go away and look at putting any structures to the north of the Great Lake Centre, so onto the onto the domain. So the the area that you're talking about for a potential building is very clearly between a realigned story place, which we've yes. always talked about yes. straightening it up to go down to the boat harbour, and your existing building platforms. Yeah. So not necessarily the existing buildings, it may be that this piece of work says let's demolish something around there we don't know but yeah. that platform that envelope great lake center library and to that road is what you've always talked about as being the envelope yeah. i i totally agree with that but in the structure plan and i've got a feeling we were supposed to take it out but there was the road that leads through the domain, the grassed area connecting to Tamamutu Street. This will not, I do this will not, not want to see that in the precinct or in the calculations. This will not the, have that. This, we've got that assurance. You can minute that right now. This will not. Right, have that. please minute. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, this community is going to blow up. Look, the. The only relevance from of the northern domain in terms of this piece of work will be the linkages from the domain back through into the into this precinct and this Great Lake mm -hmm. Centre and from the town centre back. So, so w when we're doing it, when we look at where doors are and what architectural things go, that yeah. there's no problem. People that. can walk from one to the other. Yeah. There is no intention <coughs> of doing any physical work on that side of the domain. Okay. And can I ask another question, please? How are we proposing to accommod accommodate car parking facilities? Uh, that's the purpose of doing the master planning, is to consider a whole range of different issues and options. Car parking will be one of those. Um, you'll remember yeah. through the commercial industrial it's just structure not, plan... It just don't actually highlight in the report actual car parking. And if that's, a, if that's a really high priority for you as a council, then we will bring that back as a very specific item in the scope. Because you remember we've talked about coming back to you in April yes, with yes, a very yes. clear defined mm. scope for the master mm. plan. There'll be an opportunity in that scope to be very clear about uh, your parameters around car parking. Okay. Also an opportunity to identify uh, specific elements that you might not want, such as the road uh, roading or building within the north domain. So you've got that control through setting the scope for the master planning exercise. Those words have all been minuted, please. Yeah. Um, just one Thank other you. question. In, if, if in accepting these recommendations, one through to four, does that then mean that the um, other two sites, mm -hmm. option two and three, are therefore released? No. No, th this is simply a process of, I guess, doing, doing due diligence, collecting more information about the Great Lakes Centre site. We know quite a lot about the other sites. They're relatively straightforward. Uh, you take the car park, Tufrotoa Street car park as an example. There's not a great deal of complexity associated with that site. This site, the GLC site, has a lot of complexity, given all the different variables involved there. That's why we need to do more work on this site. I guess it's really we will come back at the end of the master planning exercise and at that point you get to make a call. You, you get to look at all the relevant information and make a decision about the side or that site being your preference. Do you remember the discussion that we had at the workshop where um, when we talked about building a museum which happened to have offices in it in this location, 
and, and I think the discussion from several people, um, Councillor Hoeklein led the discussion, I think, was if you aren't building a museum, then this may not remain our preferred site, you know, if you're not able to, to link it in. So, you know, if you were looking at either the Tours, the other two options, Tupere Tour Street Car Park or the old Lake Terrace site, they, they have to stay on the table in case you don't like what you see out of this, out of this master planning mm. process. So at the completion of this, you then make that decision. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, um, thanks, Nick. Look, uh, when I was re reading this report, I suppose in um, you know the recommendations really do sum up um, w where this needs to go. But I suppose um, what excites me a little bit about this is, is you know, when we talk about our civic administration building, just that those very words are like, oh God, boring, very square. Um, what we had was a presentation from a suitably qualified person who started to open our eyes to the opportunity and the potential for the opportunity and I think that's the thing that's probably guiding me along this theme of thought which is you know if, if we talk about the other things we've talked about the you know the, the museum and, and supporting um, parts to this vision I suppose it, it does change the, you know the, the whole view of the project so I think I think the, the actual heading is probably a little bit wrong um, whilst whilst the administration building I guess is, is a key part of it you know the um, like Gareth alluded to the you know it all adds value and it, it all I guess leads down to a, a particular vision or or, or um, a particular theme that we're trying to achieve down there. So, so you know, I, I'm certainly for starting to head down that road. I think this is a responsible way to approach it because we just don't know what we don't know. And, you know, at the end of the day, once you start to walk down that road, it might be just something that we just can't do, but we don't know that yet. So I'm certainly supportive of the, the recommendations in front of us just to move us along that, that pathway to explore what might be potential. Councillor Kingy. Any other, uh, Councillor Johnnons? Thank you, Your Worship. Just a couple of questions from me, Nick, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of it's in regard to the scope of the master plan. Um, we've, we're talking about the museum, but will we also talk about future proofing plans for the library and the GLC within that master plan? Because I would hate us, I would be reluctant to design something and then we haven't future proofed ourselves for expansion yes. in those other areas. Uh, the eyesight as well. Sure. Um, so we've got a range of facilities in that location and the whole purpose of this master planning exercise is to look at what their future holds and how best they are integrated. Sure, okay. So um, just if you could be with me, just a couple of other quick, quick questions. Um, our commercial industrial structure plan, mm -hmm. am I correct in that we never assumed that we would put TDC offices in that civic centre if we ever built one? What was our and this our plan outlined there. So what the structure plan says is uh, there are a range of civic facilities in that location at this point in time um, that council wishes to see more activity in that location and expects or, or understands that one of the ways of achieving that is to put more civic facilities sure. there. Doesn't say exactly what those will be and what shape or form or when leaves that open. Sure. It's simply a concept that that's a heart to our town centre and we wish to see that grow over time. Okay, so I guess the discussion will be in the consultation whether that heart includes our TDC admin. Exactly. Okay, um, just a couple of quick um, other ones is, I understand, I was just doing a bit of desk research too, there's um, some work that's been done in the space around our cultural heart. There was a Luart report done back in the early 2004. Will we revisit some of that work that was done that as part of the master plan? Uh, so that report and a number of others were provided to um, uh, Mr Marriott, Wayne Marriott, who came and talked to you. Um, so they fed into some of his thinking. They will certainly form part of that background information. Okay. Um, and I'm nearly at the end of my questions. Is it possible to include in the scope I'm very keen on this, if we are looking at investigating a master plan like this, how sustainable it is as an option for our community. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important that we understand the f potential funding models that we might utilise to help support this type of development, <coughs> because there are many options and yes. we need to look at the sustainability of it in a community of the size that we've got. Okay, and um, mm -hmm. the last one, the way I read this report is um, as we develop the master plan, oh, you've got to set up a project team yet if we go ahead, mm -hmm. but a key part of forming that master plan will be having consultation with 
key stakeholders across the community in the development of that plan? Well, what you've heard from Wayne and from others is that uh, a project of this scale and this importance to the community only ever gets traction led. if the mm. community buys in. Sure. Um, that's going to require us to spend some time and energy making sure that they understand why we're doing it and what benefits come out of it and how they would like to see it shaped going forward. Yeah, because so I think it's important to understand how people want to use that space. Yes. Yeah, yeah for what purpose. Okay, thank Councilor you. Councillor Rankin. Um, through the Chair, my question's around the funding too. Will you be able to give us an indication during this process of the kind of government funding that might be available? Because I know that they are willing, well, the previous government was willing to contribute a significant amount to something that houses a disaster recovery centre, for example. Yes. Museums get a lot of funding philanthropically and um, in terms of the government. Mm -hmm. So will we, will you be giving us an indication of what that kind of support might be? Because that could be a major contribution to the cost. Uh, most certainly. Uh, you will, at the end of the master planning, you'll be at a point where you'll have a whole lot of information about the GLC site. You've already got information about the other sites. You'll then go out to the community and you'll talk to the community about that range of options. As part of that conversation, we have to have that information around right. funding implications and opportunities. It, it's crucial I to understand the different options. And just further to that, at the, um, the workshop um, and in this paper, Mr Marriott talked about um, museums having a, a third, third, third. So um, the model around the country is, is a third local government, a third central government and a third other, which is... Um, as your other business and philanthropic, mm. I can never say that word, philanthropic. Um, so, so that's sort of the, the business model for a museum. Um, depending on what other activities you put in there, you that that changes. But that's a sort of the ballpark figure. Councillor Harvey, thank you. Um, look, uh, it was very exciting to hear the presentation. Um, was it this Monday? Last Monday? Last Monday. So, a, a lot of the questions that have been asked today were covered during that workshop. Mm. And there was exciting funding options, which was fantastic, right down to designs. Um, he's designed museums in the past. It was really quite exciting. So um, I think that everything has probably been covered, and I think we should move ahead. OK, any other questions yeah, of Mr Carroll? Yeah. Councillor Body. could just make the comment, um, the structural plan doesn't actually mention uh, or doesn't promote a TDC office in that particular area, does it? Uh, it doesn't specifically say Taupo District Council should have a civic administration building mm -hmm. here. Thank no, it, it, it just talks about putting more civic facilities into that location, one of which could or could not be uh, office activity. It also says it doesn't say that it shouldn't be either. So it's no. yeah, it's yeah, the page 53. To the other question I raise is, um, I was delighted with the presentation in regards of a museum. Um, but my thinking is strained away a little bit in regards of the options for a civic building, whatever size it would be. I'm very conscious we have, what, 23,000 ratepayers, I think, in our district. And while a large amount of funding will come from outside the district, hopefully, we have to bear that in mind. I'm all for the museum, etc. I have no problem with that. But I am a little bit disappointed, and Councillor uh, Park raised it in regards of the other two sites, that when we're going to go out to have an option we don't also include those that might not be our preferred option so the ratepayer or the citizens of the district can actually look at what those other alternatives are so at this stage i'm not prepared to support the resolution until we as a council actually see some paperwork on those other options so maybe i can help to answer that so those other options um you have there and you have the um because the, they are just talking about civic administration buildings so you're talking about the the 15 million dollars that we've always talked about for either the old lake terrace site or the um the other site the Tibetator street car park mm -hmm. obviously not using the lake terrace site has an income line there as well um the purpose of this recommendation though and this and what we're asking for is to simply go away and and do the work that then enables you to do exactly what you say and for the community to do what you mm. say in terms of do we spend X dollars on the on the Great Lakes Centre to build a, a museum with an office on it and it will cost us this amount or do we spend this amount over on one of those other two sites which gives you a civic administration building that nobody wants except for staff. So, so this is enabling us to have that, that 
or for the community to have that conversation and weigh up where their priorities lie. Without that, the the only answer that we've got is like what we're given with you, which is is there's no detail. You know, we can't say to them it will cost you X dollars to do this at this site because we don't know. Councillor okay, so Park. Um, yeah, for the, I, I, we have been through this a few times in rec, and it, I think it's good for the public to hear some of the concerns that and that we've had around the table, but. I'm happy to move this resolution. Um, I think that going forward to look at the site, which actually isn't my preferred site for a s administration building in the first place, um, is really exciting and um, something that would be really bold and brave to do. So I'd really, really like to have a look at what that looks like um, before we just settle on building a building full of offices, mm. four offices. Um, so yeah, happy to move the recommendations one through four. Okay, thank you. Urgency. Just to clarify uh, Councillor Body's point, so the, the second option, you know, the second and third option will be in the long term plan uh, as a, a statement or a uh, what, how will it be in there? It won't be in there or will be in there? That'll be up to you at the point when you start to look at the long term plan. So, so yeah. you remember we're not talking about putting um, any of this into the current long term plan that you're working on. Um, we, are, we are suggesting that we put $15 million in because we're saying um, that will have to be spent anyway regardless of the site. We're not looking at putting anything in this in the long term plan about this site, the other sites. Okay. We're saying that will be an LTP amendment once you've got this information and you know where you're right. going. Okay. So at that point, you say to the community through your long term plan um, consultation process, this is our preferred site for these reasons. This is how much it's going to cost. Here are the other options for this. It's going to cost that. What do you think? And then the community gets an opportunity to, to have a say. Okay. So therefore, Mr. Chairman, in regards of the paper that's going out for consultation, we won't be mentioning the civil civic complex, is that right? It'll, it'll, prov it'll provide the um, $15 million um, spread over a couple of years because again, regardless of where it is, we're realistic that we have to spend that money. What we, what we do, and whether or not that's enough, to, to depending on what else you put in, is yet to be determined based on this piece of work. So effectively the document's going to say we're allowing $15 million over a given period towards something that we're not quite sure yet. Correct. Oh, correct. No mention of either ors, no mention of prefers, nothing. Because, because we don't have those facts yet until okay. we do this piece of work. Well, if that's the case, I will accept the resolution. Okay. Mm. All right, it's been moved by Councillor Park, seconded by Councillor Harvey. All those in favour, please say aye. Those against? Gary. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Nick. Right, 5.6 Lake Ohakuri Jetty. Uh, we've got, uh, who have we got here? Ella? Afternoon, Council. Good afternoon, Ella. So this report is to consider a request from a member of the public to accept ownership of a pontoon jetty to be installed at Lake Ohakuri. The report recommends that Council decline to accept um, ownership due to cost risk and liability reasons outlined in the report. I'll take the report as read um, and I'd like to introduce Chloe Walker who's here today in her capacity as a member of the public um, at Aotea Moody and I think she would like to speak to council on this item. Okay. Hi Hello, Chloe, how are you? Welcome back. Thanks, it's a bit strange to be on the other side of the table today but... Yeah. If you just want to turn your buzzer on and turn yours off, if that's all right, Ella. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chloe, nice to oh, see you. Thank you. Thank you for having me uh, here today. Um, as Ella mentioned, um, I uh, live in Atimuri Village um, and um, am a member of the wider Atimuri Ohakuri community um, and have been involved in the fundraising for the pontoon um, that we have successfully fundraised to get replaced um, for Ohakuri Dam. Um, and I guess just really today, unfortunately Barry, who has put the request in, um, was unable to attend. So he asked if anybody else from the community would be available and I said, oh yeah, <laughs> come along and have a, have a wee chat. Um, and I guess really just to support what you will have seen in the attachments from him, there is significant community support for this to go in. It's been quite disappointing to lose the jetty that we've got at Ohakuri. Um, we've got one on Lake Atamuri but nothing on 
Aukuri at the moment. It's a pretty big health and safety risk at the moment. It's not enjoyable for um, recreation users in the same way as it has been in the past. Um, and so it's been great to get community buy-in to be able to purchase the, the GC um, as it stands. Um, and really what he's looking to do is to gift that to the Taupo uh, community, um, to the council, um, because we don't have a specific organisation for that at the moment. So, and he doesn't want to personally have it under his name, have the consensual under his name, which has certain, obviously if he does, um, you know, leave our community or other things, that's kind of from a succession perspective a bit of a challenge. So, yeah. Right, so what we've got is a, a, a quite a um, highly visible part of the river, isn't it? And it's used very much by locals. And they've got a jetty that is existing use, but they want to replace it. Well, there's no jetty now. No. Um, Mercury removed the jetty uh, last year um, yeah. because it was in disrepair and because of increased their perspective around increased health and safety. Right and risks associated with that GT. And, and there are other GTs along the river. Um, I know that the council owns one at Atemuri, um, which is beside that launch ramp. Um, there's another one at the Mihi Bridge, which is, um, sorry, at the Tūtikau Road Bridge, um, which is, um, again, in reasonable disrepair, but like a few, it's actually on the other side, so it's Rotorua's Okay, so, side, so we, we technically own those uh, ones? That I believe you about? own the Atem Muri one. Right, okay. Oh, you, maybe you... We don't own any. Um, we uh, reluctantly um, maintain some, but but there's, we don't have any on our asset, manage, on our asset base. Okay. So we've in, inherited the, the management of some of them. Yeah. Okay, um, and but the others are on the Rotorua, but are owned by Rotorua District, are they? Or I'm yeah, not sure. okay, all right. So how do we? You know, well, let's the, the community need to be applauded for getting out, fundraising, getting this thing built. How can we achieve them doing this? Yeah, you know, like can we have an indemnity or something like that that we don't? We're not ongoing for liability or um, maintenance and all that sort of thing. Basically. We want it to happen. Well, I, I personally would love it to happen, but we don't want to be responsible for the little little old lady falling off the boat going into the river. Yeah. You know? So how do we get? Is there any way of getting around it, Ella? So you can't contract out of your health and safety obligations. Those will remain. Yeah. Um, I have prepared an alternative resolution. Um, if you decide to accept ownership, that is um, basically some words and conditions in an agreement with Mr Murphy and those conditions would reduce risk for council so they would be things like um, receiving a report from an engineer that the structure had been installed properly, um, receiving advice from the manufacturer of the product or a qualified professional on maintenance recommendations because at this stage we're not sure um, what the recommendations are to maintain the pontoon. Uh, other conditions would be obviously that the consents um, with Waikato Regional Council and Mercury are transferred to Council um, and that we're satisfied with those the conditions of those consents. So there is an alternative, I've got it here, an alternative wording for a resolution. Um, if you do decide you do see benefit um, to the community, that outweighs the cost of liability to Council. Um, also a condition would be that council satisfied it can feasibly maintain and monitor the jetty to a professional standard. You'll note that it's in Okuri, so it is relatively um, an isolated asset for assets owned by council, um, and we would need to be satisfied that we can monitor it appropriately. Cool. Councillor Park? Um, I suppose this is on the other side of Hook Hall, so it's probably. I don't know, but I was just wondering, being a structure on water, what is their, what is Iwi's, or the, the hapu in that area, what are their feelings about the structure? So Mr Murphy is consulting with Rokawa at the moment about their views on the structure, and um, that's a requirement for him getting resource consent with the Waikato Regional Council, and Yes, they'll take into account Ewe's views on the structure. Councillor Truman?
think uh, I think that what they're saying is though that they're happy to sign something that is, will not cost us anything. Yeah. Correct? As well as appreciation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so the community have um, will will we will maintain it um, ourselves, but I guess it comes down to what I was yeah. report. How many people use it? Would use it? Oh. I couldn't give you a specific number, but in summer it's incredibly well used. There's yeah. only two access ways now onto Lake Ohakuri up to Paradise, up to Oraki Krako, um, three if you count the Mahi Bridge, but that's a very long way away. It's it's a very inaccessible lake apart from yeah. those two sites to access that lake. So it's very popular for boats, and it's a nice. It is a lovely area. We go stand up paddleboarding there and um, kayaking. It's it's a great it's a great space, yeah. um, and it has been just positive for the cool. any other comments, Thank Councillor you. Williamson? Hi. Um, with you know, picking up on you know, Kirsty's point, with regard to health and safety and mitigating the risks around, um, obviously the health and safety policy is quite prescriptive, but on the other hand, there is elements introduced like duty of care, and whether you have good signage down there, pointing out without you know, certain risks, you know, being careful, and also things which mit perhaps mitigate in the eyes of Health and Safety Act, yeah. possibly. Yeah, appropriate yep. signage would be beneficial, I imagine. Councillor Stewart? Yeah, when I read this, um, I was along the same lines as um, thinking as um, Councillor Truman, that um, I think it's, it would be something that we really need to look at how we can actually support this initiative from, and it will be from both communities, and I'm, I'm very supportive of finding a way. Any other queries? Through the Johnson. chair. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, Chloe. Um, just a couple of quick questions from me. Um, look, I'm in support of this. I think communities that want to take ownership and get something done should be applauded. So you, you have my full support for this. I just had one question to ask. Had you considered investigating whether you could set up a trust or an incorporated society to take ownership of the GT? It's a possibility. Again, somebody at the end of the day has to be liable and, and has to own an entity like that. And, and I guess what I would say to that, and that is probably our last course of resort as we set up a, you know, it seems a little bit ridiculous that we have to know, set does, up an entire incorporated society to own a jetty when a council is already managing multiple jetties across the district. Yep. And, and I, you know, Kirsty's point, I guess, you know, we don't have that many services that could deliver to rural and, and smaller communities like ours, okay. so. Too true. Okay, thank you. Council body? Good, nice to see you again, Chloe. How's the farming going? Farming's going brilliant. Yeah, excellent. Yep, loving this rain. Um, <laughs> you, you still got the ramp, which seems to be a bit of a hassle as well. If you read one of the letters that came in from Mr Murphy, he talks about road safety, uh, people being agitated in short tempers, it takes much longer, I suppose, to launch the boat. So effectively, the pontoon is going to replace the wharf. So it's not going to assist in the launching of boats or anything like it, that, is it? It'll assist significantly. So what's happening at the moment is people are having to walk on, potentially, to the boats, and there's no way to hold the boats on the side, and you're having to get people who are dropping their cars. So the time taken to, to bring people down to the... Whereas you could literally just launch your boat, get out, jump on the jetty, and, and it's nice and simple. Have you ever been at Little Acacia Bay on a busy afternoon? Probably, yes, some same, months ago. It's the same, but I support yep. what you're trying to do. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Um, so what was that second uh, recommendation? <laughs> yeah. um, I think, you know, like, I... from my perspective, I think it's great that we're doing something in that, up in that area. What a wonderful community. Got out, done, got off their proverbials and, 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 and did the necessary fundraising and all that sort of thing. And that needs to be applauded. And if we can help in one small way, as long as their health and safety, as long as the conditions mm -hmm. are all met, as far as they are concerned, uh, uh, it has our full support. And, and as Councillor Truman says, we don't come out of the sun up there very much. Yeah, we're not there, not that present very often. So here's our chance to uh, uh, get a good bit of goodwill too. So okay. uh, can I give you the, the wording for this yes. alternative? Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. So council agrees to enter into an agreement for sale and purchase with Mr Murphy for the pontoon jetty to be installed at Lake Ohaguri, and that such agreement is conditional upon. Uh, council's chief executive being satisfied with the conditions of all necessary consents required for the installation and use of the pontoon jetty. A report from an independent and suitably qualified engineer on the installation, structural integrity, suitability and design. 
advice received from the manufacturer of the product or a suitably qualified professional on maintenance recommendations for pontoon uh, jetty structure. Council's ability to feasibly, feasibly maintain and monitor the jetty to a professional standard. Signage and that sort of thing is Councillor Jollins. Uh, do we need to put something about the necessary health and safety signage in there? Will that be on one so of the conditions? Signage would come within um, just our day to day management yeah. of the structure. Okay. Uh, B, all necessary consents required for the installation and use of the jetty. Um, be successfully transferred to council. All right, there it is. There. We have a mover. We can move by Councillor Stewart, seconded by Councillor Truman. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Those against, carried. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you, Chloe. You Thank for you, Ella. Everyone, it's appreciated. Thank you. So I'm dropped off. Not too excited. Right, right, yo, where are we up to, guys? 5.7, 100 Kinlock Road, tree removal. Mike? Okay, okay thanks, Anna. Right, Michael. Hi, welcome again. Good afternoon. Uh, so, uh, the, the background to this project is we are seeking to install a second access to the Kinlock Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is an all-weather access. The access we have at the moment, which comes off just past the bridge at Lyland Drive, uh, after heavy rain, there's a big ponding area, it can be up to a metre deep and uh, operators can't access the site. So um, we've got a lot of work proposed at the Kinlock Wastewater Plant, as you're aware, over the next few years, and uh, an alternative access to make sure we've got access at all times is proposed, um, which is on um, see on the map on page two. Um, okay. The problem we have is a tree, which is not the tree itself in its location is not impeding access, but the root zone of the tree um, spreads across the um, vehicle proposed vehicle crossing. Uh, and our brist's advice is that um, excavating to install a vehicle crossing uh, would in the long term kill the tree. So uh, we're asking for that tree to be removed. The alternative um, proposed by the arborist is to install a plastic mat, um, which is like a grid type mat of say six, 60 mils deep, and you fill that with soil and it protects the root zone, but you create a bit of a hump in the, in the crossing and it's not that friendly for big trucks because we have some big tankers and things going in and out of there. So. Right. In the long term, the maintenance of that type of thing is a bit... How long will I... So just one poplar tree to go? Yep, it's at the... There's right. a long string of poplar trees when you go to Kinnock on the right hand side. And it's the very last tree on that string. Okay. Does the chairman of the Kinlock committee have any comments on that? tender on this as soon as possible, but we could exclude this um, the crossing. Okay, no, bef yeah, we'll we need to come back to you with a contract to award okay. related to this project anyway, which is yeah. so you requesting to fair it, Barry, or? Well, no, I'm just on well, yeah. yeah. So there's a tender, but there's also the need for a resource consent if we're treating it as as a protected tree. So there'll, there'll be. So there'll be opportunities there for, for that to happen. No, I was I was just going to clarify that because it's potentially a protected tree, we'd need a resource consent before we took it down anyway. So 
that would need to be notified. It's part, you know. My understanding is that we're treating it as, as if it was because it's in a line of protected um, because we don't specifically know whether or not this specific one is or not. The line is, but as this last one, we don't really know. But we're treating it, which is the right thing to do, I think, treating it as if it is. So, what do you want to do? You want it to be deferred, or do we? No, no, I think you can make the decision. Make decision. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Yes, While we're important. talking trees and consents, can we add additional trees in the consent process to get them removed? I mean, the normal course of events is go through the Fred Committee, correct? Well, if, we go, if we're going to go to a consent hearing for this one tree, can we group others, like the gum trees across the road from Countdown? Um, um, the difficulty is that each has to be assessed on its merits, and we need to get the. And we've been through this before. With you, they need to get the arborist opinions. I would say that the the best way of doing that will be under the review of the district plan when we look at trees, um, and that all that will do is is, um, is essentially delay this process. Do you also raise it on a more serious note with what happened in Rotorua? I'm not sure where the involvement of the council is there, but it does concern me. Even at the Kinloch Reserve, when I asked the question of our legal beagle, the fact that every fortnight our arborists go out and check those trees, having done that, that removes us. We're taking all care and responsibility to save something from happening, but it's only a matter of time, and that's what concerns me. So trees generally, and I spoke to Councillor Rankin about this just earlier today, um, trees generally uh, after after Rotorua are concerning me as well, probably the thing that keeps me awake at night. Um, what we've done um, is, is um, contracted some external arborists to come along and, and do an assessment of our trees which would triage those that are um, higher risk, so around playgrounds, houses and where people congregate basically. Um, so we're doing a, an assessment of those, we're also doing an assessment of um, all the complaints that have been made and other information that we may have on file and see what we've done with that and get those specifically looked at. Um, so at least if the worst happens and something does happen we've got a, a, a um, peer-reviewed external advice saying this tree is safe or you should do this, this and this to keep it safe. Um, I'm mean, positive that that's going to result in the need for some more trees to be removed. I also raised a, one to do with the Norfolk Pine at Snells Beach in Auckland Way where they, they had a real battle because the developer wanted to remove a tree. He won his battle in the end and when it was cut down that tree was only a matter of years away from actually falling itself because internally it was rotting and that's the problem that we've got they look good, but they look strong, but there are ways of that being. No CCTV. Yeah. All right, Michael, sorry. Um, we've di divested of that. <laughs> uh, so the recommendation there, um, just obviously don't pull it down straight away, but we've uh, proven to pull it down. So um, Barry um, and Roseanne, you have to notify the, the group. Um, uh, they could not represent the group. It would have been a good first job for them, actually. But never mind. Um, so uh, the recommendation is there. Did I have a mover? Moved by Councillor Kingy, seconded by Councillor Rankin. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Those against? Carried. Just to add to it, it says in the res recommendation, replacement popular. I hope it's not a popular. It's put back there. <laughs> uh, how do I get back here? Can I get back to the start? Oh, that's, yeah. Right, 5.8, updates to Topol District Council traffic control devices. Oh, Dennis. Good Surprise. afternoon again, Dennis. Your Worship. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, yes, Your Worship, this would have already gone to Fred, but um, the last Fred meeting was um, cancelled, and it relates to some um, parking outside of this building down through to the side of... Um, Hugh Street down to Tedarapunga Street, and I refer you to the plan on page 202, I think it is. Um, and if you have a look at that plan, you'll see there there are some parking areas in red, um, a bank of seven, a bank of nine, and, and one on its own. And the proposal is to turn those into 90 minute parks. So, what are the reds at the moment? Uh, I believe they're um, all day parking. All day, is it? And across the roads all day? Yep. Yeah. So 
see, we should. Yes, uh, uh, Councillor Williamson. Uh, obviously, it's to do with time restrictions, but are there, are there any car parks? I remember a few months ago I mentioned perhaps the possibility of putting a disabled car park in front of the, down the at least in front of the office, our, our chamber, for a disabled car park. Uh, through the chair, that, that conversation was around um, what's uh, was number one there, or um, number one there was that single park there, and that, that position wasn't wide enough for a disabled park because of the driveways either side. So the closest disabled one would be the medical centre? So yes. You could add more, um, another disabled car park. The disabled car park takes up more space than, you know, than, than one park, so you would end up losing... Would it be two, Dennis? Two, two parks. for one? Two parks. Yeah, the Possibly difficulty you have here is you've, you're limited by the number of vehicle entrances into the, into the, into the property, so that all of those car parks are right up against the various uh, vehicle entry points. Very good. Okay. Um, everyone happy with that? Ah, that's yeah. correct, yes. A little distant, be 50 metres, 80 metres probably, somewhere around there. Remembering that being, um, sorry, remembering that by putting these restrictions in, in theory there'll be more availability of car parks down there anyway, mm. and um, your mobility car doubles your time restriction, so so you're allowed to double the mm. posted um, restriction if you've got a mobility card showing. All right, any other questions of Dennis? Recommendation there? Could I have a move please? Moved by Council Body, seconded by Council Williamson. All those in favour please say aye. Aye. It's against. Carried. Right. Easement request on Tangarero Domain. Mr Nathan Murray. Good afternoon Nathan, happy new year. Unison have requested an easement uh, over Tongaro Domain. Um, most of it is within the existing road at Story Place, but part of it goes across the domain uh, towards the museum. Um, the purpose of this is to increase the security of the power supply to the CBD, which is already uh, pretty much over their limit. Um, so, yeah, they're just requesting that they are able to ensure the security of power supply. Cool. Um. Any questions of Nathan? Um, so it's all under the ground, obviously? Uh, yes, it's all underground. It will be thrusted underground, so there'll be no trenches, no digging. It should be all be uh, reasonably contained. Cool. Councillor Hickling. Uh, yeah, I believe perhaps not that bit, but the bit that runs between along the domain there must be there is an existing line. Uh, it's going to be they're going to hook up to one, then disconnect that so that they can get two separate feeders in. So unfortunately I was unaware of the contents of the report which came to you until it came out in the agenda. Um, so I'm aware there is some contradictions in the two reports. Um, we don't believe, if Story Place is straightened, it's all underground, it should not affect the services too much. So, so through the chair, the red line is all in the existing road reserve and the, the plan is to actually do work in the I forget the terminology, the local purple reserve, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Lewis can explain, we had a discussion on this. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's through, it's through the chair. Um, this, These plans were sent through to everyone in one of the um, councillor week update prior to Christmas, so we've been in discussion with Unison for some time about this upgrade, 
we've certainly made them aware of the proposed project. They need they need to do this sooner rather than later. Yeah. Yeah. It would be great to have everything aligned, um, but it's not always possible. Put the speaker on, Barry. Sorry. So officially, that uh, this was supposed to go to the Fred Committee. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not yeah, worried. No, about so I'm just that. saying. So officially, that's the only bit that we're really considering because no. that's the only bit that um, the Fred Committee would have had. Yeah. Um, the opportunity to, to go. It's all so what would you like to know about? Well, it's all one? underground, I yes. assume. Yes. So there's not going to be any damage to the trees or the... Like no, we've looked at that and we've we've said to Unison we don't want any damage to the trees. The thrusting should be contained yeah. enough and the trees large enough that the, any potential okay. damage to the roots shouldn't have any lasting impact. Okay, thank you. So that's the question because I'm, I'm struggling with the map. The first one, the top one on page 206, the blue line is the required easement area. Yeah. And if we go to what Councillor Hickling was talking about, the next one down shows the blue, but on page 260, uh, 210, that's, that's all in red. So as Mr Strong was just said, that's still roadside reserve. Why is the blue line there with the red in between it? I think I through the chair I can answer this. The photograph, so you've got the, I'm just trying to find the number, sorry. Um, page two of the report, the second photograph, so that's one down the bottom, shows a section of blue line. Yeah. That is in the reserve land because the public road finishes where that blue, la blue line starts. Oh, yeah. So the re that road is in reserve land, hence the, the need for the easement. Line is if it's in road reserve, no easement's required. Yes, they have a right. That's the difference. Yep. Right. <coughs> so all, roads, all roads in the district, um, any, um, what are they called, uh, network, Utili utility, ne utility network, they are entitled and permitted without our approval, essentially, we get Discussion um, around road opening with and reasonable stuff like that. conditions, but they they are able to put that in. So it's only when they go off that road reserve that we have an ability to have a say. I don't know what's planned through the reserve land, but certainly within the road reserve, we um, do as best we can to ensure that location um, best suits our needs. Right, Nathan. Back to you. That's it. Yeah. So the easement with the, with the reserve, uh, we don't know what the plans are moving forward, so we just yep. have to work with what's in front of us. And at the moment, we believe this is you know, a priority for the CBD. Okay. So right, Unison yeah. have accepted the fact that there is planting over that easement on the, you know, the one that goes through to the bowling club. Uh, some of that planning has been taken out to try and open up once we took over the third green. So where it goes through, there is actually yeah, where I it believe goes there's through. no planting, but there are the two but trees further up. Yes. Yeah, well, because there's um, uh, Kate, Kate Bush, was it the women's rights? There's a garden, there's a garden there with white camellias and stuff in. Yeah, no, I assure you we'll take all care to make sure that all vegetation is protected and is still there once they're finished. Okay, thank you. Kate Bush. Uh, was it, is it Kate Bush or? Um, mm. what? She was a singer, wasn't she? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, what's, what's, uh, you know, Kate Shepherd. Uh, Shepherd, is it? Kate Shepherd, yeah. yeah. Okay. School C, five subjects. Oh, I know it was close. <laughs> I mean, it was close. Oh, it was close. <laughs> it was close. So, you know. All right. Um, well, there's a garden there. There's a garden there for Kate Shepherd. Is there? Yes. Well, oh, I didn't know that. Did you know that, Nathan? 
<laughs> yeah, we've got there's a garden there. Right, see how. All right, so minister recommendation there. Um, just one other quick question. I may have read you, the paper sir. incorrectly. I was just looking at the document supported by Unison. So we're talking about some extra power poles and um, feeder boxes and things. As, yeah, really? Yeah, again, that's all in the uh, road corridor. Um, oh, that's... Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's separate to the easement over the reserve, which we're considering at the moment, unfortunately. So because be there's some of that's in our new res um, areas that we've just done up to look beautiful. And we're putting boxes in there. Well, well they are. Right, they can do that, can they? Oh. Can we have some conversation with them, really? Right. We are aware of projects, especially with Keep New Zealand Beautiful, which have funding for painting up and beautifying boxes, and we're working on those with Chorus at the moment. So yeah, we I'd can, like, we can I'd look like to, to think, that with yeah. Unison as well. Okay, yeah, if we could adopt that with Unison, maybe we have some sort of collaboration, um, because this is, I'm sorry, as ugly as anything. Yeah, so there will, will probably be some modifications, minor modifications needed to the easement. Um, Ella and Nigel will look at that for us, and I'm not sure if that's possible to be included as one of the conditions, but um, I'll talk to them about it. Yeah, that. if you could, that would be awesome, because, um, you know, we're trying to be helpful, and, you know, it's for everyone's mutual benefit, but there are some quite ugly visual implications for this. Okay. Councillor Stewart? Are you right? <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, recommendation there. Thank you, Nathan. Do I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Stewart, seconded by Councillor Hickling. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against? Carried. Thanks. Righty ho. Um, 5.10. Adoption of supporting information for the draft long term plan. 2018 28 consultation document. Thank you including the draft uh, revenue and financing policy to be sent away to audit New Zealand. Yes. Thanks, Sam. Okay, Hadley. Right. Uh, so essentially, uh, this item and the following four, so there's actually five items in a row here, um, are to adopt for audit uh, everything that we discussed at the council workshop last Thursday. So essentially, this is just a formality. Adopting those documents, they go off to audit, and audit will give us an opinion on all of the supporting information in the consultation document before we come back to you at the start of March to adopt it for consultation. So it's quite a stepped process, and this is just another step in that process to getting towards consultation with the community. So this first item um, is a raft of supporting information, which, again, we've talked about um, previously in previous workshops and also last week. The only difference today is that there has been some changes um, to some of the uh, items there based on the new uh, wastewater funding um, that I believe you're all aware of. So... That has changed some of the numbers in the uh, draft funding impact statement. Uh, also, there's been a change in the financial strategy. So what I've done is I've handed out single copies of all of those. Uh, and then additionally, uh, there's an, another item at the bottom there which you should be able to click on, which takes you through to the Taupo Northern Outlet and CBD investigation report. Now that's just uh, based on the workshop that you've had previously and essentially just creates a link for audit to see why we're talking about this Northern Outlet uh, in our consultation document. 
So we, we have options within the consultation document. So audit can see it, we're just formally adopting that report today. So that's this first swathe of, uh, of supporting information. And then there's two recommendations there. We'll get on to the consultation document, and that's the, the fifth, uh, fifth item. relation to two. Yep. So so that was all sent out to you um, previously and there were no changes made to that at the workshop last week. So they've just flowed through as per what you were previously circulated with. Quick look at what you're referring to. I can tell you the number should be 200, so if it's 250, we need to fix it because it's 200 is what it should be. So. It is 200. So, so we'll double check that, but 200 is definitely the limit. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that change was made, I believe, because of this particular building. So we had six, but then because the staff aren't actually based here, we changed it back to five because that's where the staff are based. Yes, it has. It has been changed in the updated versions. Yeah, um, again, with track changes, sometimes it can create blank pages throughout the document. Mm -hmm. So that was the one you raised last Thursday around companion dogs. So I've talked to Scott Devonport around that. Um, his advice was that they would be reluctant to add uh, a or sorry, take away the charge for companion dogs um, because it, it is tricky to uh, determine which is a companion dog and which is not a companion dog. He said it's much easier for, uh, say, seeing eye dogs because there's a, a formal process for those dogs. Uh, he did say that if you did want to look at something, there is a potential for a reduction in the charge of, say, 5 or $10 for companion dogs. Um, but he, he did say his strong recommendation would be to not go there just from a, from a managing it perspective. Um, <laughs> it's a bit of a dilemma if, if it's agreed by council for an action to take place. Um, how can the, how can a staff member so through, through the through different? No, so through I, the chair, I, I guess what the staff are saying is that um, that it's really hard to to implement because of that determination because there's no criteria. So a um, a CNI dog or the other do dogs they have to go through a certification process. So it's really clear that they do apply. The concern on this is, do we just take people's word that it is, and so therefore they get it for free, so all of a sudden my dog becomes one of these dogs, because there's no way of us um, doing that. Um, I guess the other way of doing it is that you could leave it to um, Fred to determine on a case-by-case, -case, because the lady who came in said there was only, I think she said, four or five of these things in the district, so you're only talking a very small number. Um, you could you could delegate Fred to, to do it on a case-by-case -case on an annual basis, 
it would become very clear to you as a committee which of those are and you just excuse those fees. So it wouldn't need to be in the fees and schedule, fees and charges schedule, but yeah. it's something that you could allow to happen. Therefore I'm just wondering Mr Chairman whether that lady that submitted could be contacted because reading up on some of these dogs, not necessarily in New Zealand, they do have to be a trained dog, like a disability dog. So there is a criteria that they have to go through to be accepted. So I'm pretty sure that would be the case. So maybe we can defer it to the free committee to do that. Right, thank you. One other query you raised as well, which I followed up on fees and charges, was around the bond for the Mangakino pool. So I uh, got some advice on that, was that uh, outside of... Um, Oh, sorry, the Mangakino pool is sometimes used as a school pool and uh, at that time there's no TDC staff there, it's taken over by the school, so a bond is charged in that instance, whereas with the Tūrangi Aquatic Centre, uh, that is managed entirely by TDC staff at all times, therefore no bond is required. And just, just finally on, on that is Treasury Management, Mr Chairman. I'm sorry to raise again, it's the use of the TIL fund. Uh, I was interested to read that the council intends to maintain the till fund assets in perpetuity, which to me would lead me to believe that it can't be used for debt repayments or anything like that. So I am stand by my argument about it, net and gross debt. It gets a bit complicated. Thank you. Yeah, the only thing I might add is if, if just those resolutions both have as amended, um, because there are amendments in those documents, so it just makes it clear that we're adopting the amended amended documents. Yep. Just are we signing that off for consultation? No. This one. Okay. Do all at once. Yeah. Yep, so there's, that's also again been discussed previously, uh, it's just a, it could have been included actually in the previous item but we separated it out just from a clarity perspective but um, again just a, f a formality. It's five five twelve in between. Prime time. Yep, so you have uh, the latest version of that in hard copy in front of you. The changes that have been made from the version that you saw last Thursday are identified in yellow. So I'm happy to go through those or, or approach it whichever way you'd like. Happy to take questions. Sure. Yep, so so uh, there's a section there in yellow on the third, well, third page in, uh, which is around your uh, values. Um, so any queries on that? Right, uh, so then if we keep moving through, unfortunately it's not page numbered, um, but there's a section called about our finances which comes after the counting our assets infographic. Uh, that <coughs> has just been updated again to include the numbers based on the wastewater charges, uh, wastewater um, amounts, so that's just been updated. Uh, Sorry, the, the page following that one. I know, but um, I, know I can read that down the bottom. We are going to have a page that we can read, please. Yes, yeah, sorry. Because this has come through three or four times. Yeah, yeah so just to be clear, this is just the content. So it's going to be designed up and it's going to look beautiful. Um, this yeah. is just, yeah, placeholder information and absolutely. There's, it's the same graphic we use in the annual report, so the designer yeah. actually holds the true copy of that. 
Okay. Yeah, my understanding is audit don't concern themselves too much with the pictures; they're more concerned with the content. So, no, I just can't <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, adjust, I'm the same. I can't read. Trying to adjust my glasses. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the the copy that you get for adoption at consultation time that will be nice and clear. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the following page, uh, so there's a change there just around the LGCI uh, description and then the new forecast rates requirement and rates increase graph. Uh, going over to the next page, uh, there's a, just a description there between the differences between uh, LGCI and CPI. So we're just going to do that visually just for the community so they understand the difference and have a brief description as well. Uh, the following page from that is the rates for different property types. Now, those have changed as well based on the new wastewater amounts. Um, but couldn't, yeah, so they have changed. You'll, you'll notice if you compare that version to last week's, there's a change in that. If you keep, keep moving through the document, uh, you get to the infrastructure strategy description, um, you'll see that there's a new issue in there. Uh, now that, that issue is replicated across both the infrastructure strategy and the financial strategy. Um, so I've handed those out just so you've got copies of, of those one pages that have changed in the infrastructure strategy and financial strategy. But essentially all they say is what's, what's uh, described there. Uh, keep moving through. Uh, there's, a, there's a table there called planned infrastructure spending. You'll see the bottom line is highlighted because that's been updated with the new wastewater numbers. Uh, and then the final change is uh, further through once you get past the Acacia Bay water uh, description, uh, there is just working to reduce our wastewater spills. So just a description around what's been proposed and two options there, which are again also replicated in the infrastructure strategy. So that's the key changes from last Thursday. So I would reiterate this is the time for content changes because once it goes to audit, um, they will give us an opinion on whatever we send them. So it's kind of <laughs> kind of the last chance before it goes to audit. Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, make a question, um, make a statement about because I made some comments on the the vision and value stuff this morning and I got a little bit hammered, um, which I have to say for the record is not really very fair. I've been consistent with my opinion on what we should do in terms of the way we frame it up. I certainly don't want to get into a discussion on what a different word means and everything, but what I do want to say, I think it's really important that the vision that we have, and I have said this time and time again, aligns with the stuff that the TDC and the team at Gareth have worked on, I do think they need to work together. And I think for me, the missing piece, and it's more in the interpretation rather than the direction of travel for it, has been really clear in our own minds what our role as the TDC is in living that vision, what our purpose is, how we will bring that to life. And I'm not quite sure we've got that 100% articulated correctly, but um, at the end of the day, I will go with, with the views of the majority, but um, I just wanted to, to reiterate that. Um, I'm not, you know, I mean, it's great that we've done it, and I agree with the direction of travel, but um, I've always been consistent in saying I think there's some extra pieces that we're missing, and I think we will confuse people slightly with our vision, the council vision, love the place we live, which I know is a tagline, but it's all getting mixed up, so um, I just wanted to make that point. But for a consultation document, um, you know, I think the designer's done a great job, and I think Lisa and her team have done a great job articulating the values that we've come up with, but I still say they're not values in the true sense when you do a vision statement. They are aspirations or our commitments or their outcomes that we want to achieve. And for me, what was missing in that piece was our sense of community responsibility, our guardianship, our stewardship, however you wanted to do that. <coughs> and we're very, we're, I feel like we're a little bit silent on the whole concept of collaboration or inclusiveness. So just wanted to add that in for the record. Thank you.
sorry. Flight path 15. Uh, council engagements, any changes? <coughs> no changes. Change it or? I would prefer, I reckon we're going to need quite a bit of time for that flight call. So we start at 1 o'clock then? 1.30. Because we're doing a flight call before. Oh, beforehand, okay. Are you and my fellow councillors happy with it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, change that please, Shani. Thank you. Alright, no other changes? Okay, move the recommendation uh, for the engagement. Thanks, Councillor Jollins. Seconded by Councillor Stewart. All those in favour, please say aye. Against carried members' reports. Any uh, members' uh, verbal reports or any tabled ones that they could come up to the front table, please. Thank you very much. We don't want to see here about Christmas parties or anything like that. <laughs> New Year's Eve's. Oh, just, uh, just a quick one, and um, I opened a, um, a sheep milking plant at Waikino Station. Incredible. Uh, Waihora, uh, millions of dollars of investment, and um, there on Tuesday, uh, what a wonderful attribute it is to, um, you know, to, to the local economy. Um, sheep milk is worth eight billion dollars a year annually, and um, there's two or three locations now in the Taupo area um, that are, are doing it. And um, I was lucky enough to be with the, he's called the Sultan. The Sultan of Dubai uh, uh, for the morning, so it was quite impressive, and also um, our various uh, investors. So, so it's we wouldn't even know in the towns what's going on out there in the community, the millions of dollars of this um, infrastructure that's been put in, and of course low NDA outlets over the lake, so no nitrogen going into the lake. So, anyway, uh, if anyone gets the opportunity to go there, Waikino Station is uh, well worth a visit. Are we? Okay. Good. Yeah. You're a good man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's very interesting. Very good. All right. That's it. Have a mover, please. Um, the members' reports be accepted. Those in favour? Uh, and then who's moved? The Councillor Stewart, seeing the Councillor Jollins. And my battery's gone. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. It's against. Carried. Okay, so we just...